Welcome everyone to our second in our series of the spring talks. So today's topic is insects, which is very um, exciting. So thanks for joining us on this, uh, your Saturday afternoon. Um, so just to begin, we would like to do an acknowledgement. So if I could just have the next slide, please. So we acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land where the inner west is located, the Gadigal and Mongol peoples of the Eora Nation, and pay respect to elders past, present and future, as well as all elders on the lands where this broadcast is being watched. This is and always will be Aboriginal land. So my name is Emma Daniel and I am the Senior Engagement Officer at the Green Living Centre. So on the next slide, I'll talk to you about some of the things that we're doing. So we are an initiative of the NOS Council for those people that aren't familiar with our program. And we support our community to live um, sustainably and really just to transition to a low carbon lifestyle. And what that really means is that we focus on energy use, water and waste and really um, things like what we consume around fashion and what we eat. So all of those um, really deep day-to-day -day, um, activities that can impact the environment. And I guess the way we do that is through workshops. We attend events usually throughout the year, lots of festivals. We have a specific festival ourselves and we run web webinars like this one. We're also on Facebook and Instagram. We have a website and a newsletter. So if there's ways um, you'd like to interact with us there's plenty um, so please um, keep in touch with us if this is one of your first um, events um, with us okay moving to the next slide um, so really really excited to have Lizzie Lowe um, with us today to run this presentation so she's a specialist in urban invertebrates and she'll share her knowledge um, of species you're likely to encounter in your backyard or maybe in the local park, and also how you can encourage and provide habitat um, for these creatures. So um, I'll just hand it over to you now, Lizzie. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Emma, and thanks so much, everybody, for coming. I'm going to put a poll up just to see if you're paying attention. We've got an initial poll here. We want to know what you're here for today. Um, there'll be a couple of these polls throughout the presentation today, so keep an eye on them. I can watch the answers as they come in and then I can share them with you as well. Um, so as Emma said, my name's Lizzie. Um, I absolutely love bugs and I'm here to, do, to talk to you today about bugs in cities, why they're so important and what we can do to encourage them. Um, I do like to keep these reasonably casual, so if you do have a question, you can either put up your hand, unmute yourself and ask the question, or you can actually write in the chat and then I'll get back to you whenever I'm pausing throughout the session. Um, but I do love to hear from you. I love hearing people's questions and the types of insects that they're finding in their back gardens. Um, so hopefully we can have a bit of a chat about that too. <clears throat> I'm seeing the poll answers come through at the moment. Um, got 10 out of 16 people that have participated so far. I'll leave that open a little bit longer and then I'll close it and you can see the answers as well. Um, so I would also like to start with my acknowledgement of country because I'm up in northern Sydney. Um, this is the, the area of the Watamadigal clan of the Darug Nation and their cultures, customs and traditions have nurtured and continue to nurture this land since the dream time. So I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And what a beautiful city it is that we live in. Now, what... Um, why I feel qualified to talk to you today is basically I've been studying insects in some way or another for the past 10 years or so. Um, I started off my career in Western Australia. I'm a Perth girl. I studied honeybees and I absolutely loved it because I was studying bees and people would go, oh, that's amazing. We need to save the bees. And then I moved to Sydney and I started studying spiders. So I did my PhD in these big, gorgeous golden orb weaving spiders and people just went, oh, yuck, why are you studying spiders? Um, but people don't realise that spiders and predatory insects are just as important as the pollinators. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. And that's where my um, kind of communication um, experience started, because I realised I really needed to talk to people about this. 
Um, I moved to Auckland after my PhD and I studied beetles for a little while. Never studied beetles, that was a mistake. They're way too hard. <laughs> they're fascinating, but there are so many species of beetles. That was quite a challenge. Um, I then worked at Macquarie University for about three years and I still have associations there where I studied spiders and animal behavior. Um, I have an environmental education business uh, where I do things like this for local councils, which I absolutely love doing. And now my full-time role is uh, I'm a senior extension scientist, which means I actually work in agriculture now. I work with agricultural pests and beneficial insects in, in agriculture as well. So what are we going to be talking about today? One of the first things we're going to really focus on is the important services that are provided by insects. So a lot of people don't usually think about insects as providing services, but there are so many important jobs that they do. While we're talking about these services, I'm going to break them down into different groups and we're going to have a look at the types of insects that we'd be seeing in our back gardens in Australia, with a lot of photos from myself and my kids holding bugs in our back garden. Um, sorry, I just had a message come up through Zoom. Um, we'll also talk about the way that we manage um, insects in cities because we actually don't do a very good job of it at the moment. Uh, and then we're going to talk about how to encourage insects in your own back garden. So insects, they're quite a fascinating subset of the life that we have on Earth. If you have a look at a pie chart of all the different animals that we have, uh, and plants and animals on this planet, then 84% of them are insects. So they take up a huge chunk of all life on Earth. If you have a look at this tiny little chunk up here, this little grey bit, that's chordates. So that is all mammals, reptiles, amphibians, birds, everything else fits in that tiny chunk and all the rest basically are insects. So we know of about just over a million different species of insects. They're the ones that have been formally identified by science, but there's likely to be up to 10 times that many that we haven't even identified yet. So we're literally going to just be scratching the surface today with the types of species we talk about. Now, I've got another poll for you. We want to know, um, I'm going to stop sharing that poll and start sharing the next one. We want to know how much you know about insects. We want to know what level of knowledge you currently have. We're not going to test you again at the end, I promise. So when we talk about the type of services that are provided by insects, most people will recognize pollination as an important service. Everybody knows that the bees pollinate our flowers and that we need that pollination service in order for these flowers to fruit and um, produce important food for us. But there are a whole lot of other really, really important services as well. Decomposition is a really big one. We've got all these important bugs that are in the soil. They're breaking down their organic matter to bring the nutrients back into the soil. Seed dispersal is one that a lot of people haven't heard of. Actually, little ants have evolved alongside a lot of Australian plants to actually pick up the seed that the plant has put down, move it further away, take it down into their nest and plant it down there so the seed grows up a long way from the parent plant. And they've actually got this little, um, little fatty, tasty thing on the end of their seeds there that the ants are attracted to. Um, a lot of insects and spiders are also very, very important sources of food for a whole lot of other native species, which I'll talk about a little bit as well. Um, and also pest control. So this is my speciality. I've been studying how we can be using native insects and spiders to actually do the pest control for us. So there was uh, a, some research recently that said that insects provide $57 billion per year to the US economy. Uh, we don't have a breakdown for Australia, but this just kind of gives you an idea of how important they are in our ecosystems. Um, but we do actually have a problem because they are under threat. And that's why we need to be thinking about how they're doing in our cities. So let's start off with pollination. Everybody recognizes honeybees, right? When I was studying bees, it was a really, really easy sell. Everybody loves honeybees. And I get it. They're actually fascinating um, little critters. So they're one of those things that the more you learn about them, you, the more you realize that you don't know. Um, absolutely fascinating. This is the queen down here. This is a worker bee. You can see the pollen that she's collected on her leg there. And this is what a wild hive can look like. This is obviously what they look like when we put them in boxes. But the awesome thing is that Australia actually has 1,700 species of our own bees. So honeybees aren't native to Australia. They've been introduced. 
um, but we've got a whole lot of our own bees and I'm going to introduce you to some of those today. One of my absolute favorite is called the teddy bear bee. And unlike honeybees, they don't live in a big hive. They actually live down in the ground. So they bury um, themselves down in a little hole. They lay their little eggs in the bottom there and they hatch out at different times of the year. And they're called teddy bear bees because they really are big and fluffy. You definitely hear them when they're flying around. Another one that a lot of us in Sydney will recognize are these gorgeous blue banded bees. And you will often see um, that they kind of, they sleep um, sitting along um, little uh, long tubes or, or um, reeds and you can actually find them in your garden all sitting along like that it's really really cute and you'll also find that these bees are really really attracted to purple so if you've got purple flowers in your garden go and check them out because I almost guarantee you that you'll be starting to see blue banded bees at this time of year. We do have quite a few species of stingless bees as well. So they do live in a hive just like the honeybees do, but they make a smaller hive and they make this gorgeous spiral structure within their hive. And they're teeny, teeny tiny as well. So you kind of like half the size of your little fingernail there uh, and they don't sting. So they can actually be a really, really wonderful um, insect to have in your back garden. And I know that some councils do encourage people to have stingless bee hives in their local areas as well. Resin bees are a really, really cute um, little, uh, they, they don't have big colonies like the honeybees do, but they can kind of live in smaller groups and they lay their eggs within um, long, thin tubes within your back garden. And they're called resin bees because they actually make uh, a thick, sticky kind of um, waxy substance that plugs up that hive. So these are often the ones that you see moving into bee hotels because they need that long, thin tube to lay their eggs in. Uh, and you'll see that the, the, the holes at the front have been covered up by these resin bees. Uh, and the leaf cutter bees. So if you've ever been out in your garden, you've noticed that something's been cutting circles out of your leaves and, and wondered what that might be. Um, this could actually be a leaf cutter bee. So you can see the sequence here of them coming along. Um, they actually look, use their little mouth parts to cut a big circle here and they take that leaf back and they put it within the hole to, um, to lay their eggs in, in their houses there. But bees aren't the only pollinators that we have in Australia that, or, or across the world, really. There's lots of other species that are very, very important for pollination as well, but they don't get nearly as much attention as the bees. This first one here is a fly. It's a hoverfly. And we're going to talk about that a bit later too, because it's not just a pollinator. The second one is just a normal old house fly. But really, all it takes to be a pollinator is to land on one um, plant, land on one flower, and then land on another flower. So if a fly is doing that, it's a pollinator. This beetle here is definitely doing that because it's covered head to toe in pollen. And as soon as it moves to another um, flower, it's going to be pollinating. And lots and lots of native species of both moths and butterflies that are pollinators as well. So I'll do a quick little plug here in the fact that Native Pollinator Week is coming up. That's um, from the 14th of November. And this is a really amazing citizen science project, which has got very, very good resources on their website if you'd like to check it out. Um, about what type of different pollinators are out there. Basically, um, all the information is on the website, but you basically sit outside and watch one... There we go. Watch one group of flowers for 10 minutes and record all of the pollinators that you see during this time. So it's, it's really based on science, the way that we do these recordings, and it's very useful information for the scientists as well. <clears throat> So the next group that I'm going to be talking about, this important job, is the decomposers. Now, a lot of these species get a really bad rap. They're not generally the kind of bugs that people are looking to encourage in their gardens, but that's one of the problems. They're actually really, really important. Um, and they can, basically, it's, it's a real problem if we don't have them in our ecosystems. So things like slaters, beetles, slugs, and snails, they get down into that soil, they eat all the dead plant material, they bring that material back down into the soil and they make sure that the plants can then take up that nutrients and continue that circulation of the nutrients within the ecosystem. And cockroaches are a really, really important part of this as well. So people love to hate cockroaches, but there are over 450 species of cockroaches in Australia. Most of them are absolutely gorgeous and very, very few of them are pests. And the main pests that we have are actually introduced cockroaches anyway. So if people tell you that the only kind of insect that they hate is cockroaches, let them know that they don't hate all cockroaches either. There's some very, very gorgeous ones, even some giant cockroaches that, um, that bury down into the ground and live in logs um, 
and people keep them as pets. They're quite charismatic little insects. Another um, uh, service that people don't actually realize is very, very important, especially in our agricultural ecosystems, is dung removal. So that's what these um, dung beetles are doing. They're actually rolling up all the poo and they're taking it away. They bring it down underground again so that nutrients can be cycled around. And CSIRO actually needed to initiate a program um, a couple of decades ago to bring introduced dung beetles into Australia because we had so many cows that our native dung beetles weren't able to do that job. And by getting that dung and taking it underground, you then stop the flies from breeding up, you stop it from fouling the, um, the grass for the cows to eat. And it's a very, very important service. So they actually have had decades worth of research where they're bringing in different species to do this important job. And we'd be in real trouble if they weren't here. Now I've got another poll here. I'm gonna test you a little bit here. I'll, I'll finish the poll I had before. Uh, I'm gonna share the results from this one. So most people think they know a little bit about bugs and don't know too much. No other experts, which I don't believe because I recognize a couple of names in the audience and I know you're experts, <laughs> um, but that, that's great. I'm glad that you're here. Um, I'm glad that we can be talking about insects today. I'm gonna stop this one. I'm gonna start the next one and I'm gonna ask you this question because there's two different species here. We'll talk a little bit about what they are with different groups really rather than different species. I want you to tell me what job you think Critter A does and what job you think Critter B does? It might be the same job, might not be, might not quite be what you're expecting. I can see a couple of answers coming through. And if, if you know what species or what type of invertebrate they are, these aren't insects, are they? They've got more than six legs. But if you do know what type of invertebrate they are, you can write them in the chat too. I'm having a quick look. Okay, we've got some mixed results coming in. That's good. Almost everyone's voted. I'll give you another two seconds to make a quick vote there. And I'll end that poll and share it with you. Okay, so most people got the first one, 12 out of 15. This first one here is a millipede. Um, and the other one is a centipede. And the, the, the millipede is a decomposer. So they're, they're mostly completely harmless to humans, although you can see on my hand here, there's a nasty um, kind of substance that's let off. It's quite stinky. And that's kind of the defense of the millipede that's on my hand. Uh, and the other one is a centipede. And so they have quite big jaws at the front and they are predators. So they might look quite similar, but they've got quite different jobs. And the main way that you can tell the difference between a millipede and a centipede is that a millipede has two pairs of legs per body segment. So lots and lots of legs. The centipede might be a little bit hard to see, but they've just got one pair of legs per segment there. And they do tend to have big jaws at the front rather than tiny little downward facing jaws. So let's talk about predators because this is my speciality. Insects and spider predators. We can actually be using these native predators in our, in, in our ecosystems to control pests. And we do this a lot in agriculture. So a lot of farms and, um, and in horticulture, they rely on these predatory bugs and spiders to come in and eat the pests, especially in organic farming, because they can't use too many insecticides. There's no risk of insecticide resistance evolving here. And I don't know if you know it, but insecticide resistance is a huge problem in agriculture, because if you spray a pest with a pesticide too many times, it actually becomes immune to it. And then you have to use nastier pesticides and more of them, and that compounds the problem. It gets worse and worse. But if you've got something like a spider coming in, they can evolve at the same rate. Um, using these kind of methods encourages biodiversity, both in farms and in cities, and you don't end up with that chemical contamination from the pesticides either. So it's, it's basically a win-win situation. And there are lots of species that can be predators. People don't realize often that ladybirds are really, really good predators, and I'll talk about them in a sec. One of my favorites are the praying mantids, and we actually used a picture of this to advertise the talk today, so you might have already seen it. This is one I actually found, actually the kids found a couple of days ago in the garden um, that I've got on my hand. A nice big one that's very common in our area. 
This one up here is a teeny, teeny, tiny camouflage species. Uh, and this one here, you can see how well it's doing eating a, fly, a beetle or something there. So they're very, very good predators. Very big eyes, and they use those front raptoral um, uh, front legs to grab that prey. They're very, very quick. Oh, and just to show you the variation in size, they can be very, very tiny. This is another one I found a very a baby praying mantid the other day. So it's another one of those um, fascinating groups of insects that's got a huge amount of variation. So these are two of my other favorites. These are called lace wings and ladybirds. They're two different groups, and these are predators we often use in agriculture. So you may not have recognized it, but you may have seen these around. This is a baby ladybird. They don't look anything like the adults. They're tiny, they're spiky, and they've got often a yellow stripe across them. And they um, are actually they're even more predatory when they're um, when they're in their larval stage than when they're adults. So these larvae are really, really good predators, especially for things like aphids. So if you've got a lot of aphids on your roses, you want lots of ladybirds. Um, same with lacewings. So you can see the lacewing eggs at the top here. This is a photo I found on a playground the other day. You can actually see the tiny babies that have hatched out under the eggs. They often lay their eggs on the end of this long stalk. And you've probably seen them in your garden and wondered what they were. They're lacewings. They hatch out into these kind of grubs. They've got big jaws at the front there and they're predators as, um, offspring, as juveniles as well. And the adults, come out, they hatch out these beautiful insects with these clear wings, clear backward facing wings and quite large eyes. And this is another picture that I took uh, last year, I think, of the adult lacewing. You can see her wings there beautifully laying those eggs um, up on the top of the roof of my house. Um, I want to talk quickly about mosquito control because people always ask me um, this idea of how can we control our mosquitoes <clears throat> without using pesticides? Because the mosquitoes love the water in your garden and we need to have water around often, but it does come with this double-edged sword. Um, so what you want to be able to do for mosquitoes is you want to make sure that you can refresh the water that's in your garden. So if it's if you've got some sitting in bromeliads, you need to spray it every couple of days, pet bowls and things and bird baths need to be refreshed. But we can also encourage birds, bats, frogs and predatory insects to control the mosquitoes for you. If you end up with a balanced ecosystem, then you've got a better chance of having less of these pests. So I'm going to have another poll here. I'm going to ask you what type of insect this is. Let me just end this poll and I'll start the next one. So tell me what type of insect you think it is. <laughs> Getting very mixed results with this one. Okay, I'll give you another one minute. There's a couple of people that are still deciding. Nobody's chosen toe biter yet. I made that one up. I'm sure there's something called a toe biter, but I'll, I'll give you a hint. That's not the right, not the right answer. Okay, I'll share that with you now. So we've got six people that say it's an earwig. A couple of people think it's a beetle. A couple of people think it's a termite. And a couple of people got the right answer. So this is a dragonfly. This is a dragonfly larvae. This is what they look like when they're juveniles. And they actually live underwater at this stage. And as you might have guessed from this picture down here, these big jaws, they are amazing predators. And they're very, very good at eating mosquito larvae that live under, under the water. Um, so what happens is they'll basically be down the water. They'll climb up the reeds when they're ready to um, molt. They'll pull out of that original skin, come out, dry their wings, and then they fly around. And they're actually very good predators as adults as well. So they can catch the flying mosquitoes when they're adults. They can catch the larvae mosquitoes when they're juveniles. They're definitely something that you want to be having in your back garden if you've got water around. Uh, and damselflies as well. So the same kind of group. They're also predators. Only difference, main difference between um, dragonflies and damselflies is that damselflies have backwards pointing wings and dragonflies have wings that go out to the side. So I, I promised that we'd talk about hoverflies again, and that's because hoverflies are also amazing predators. 
when they're in that juvenile stage. So um, we know that they're a fly rather than a bee because they've only got one set of wings. Bees have two set of wings, but they do look a lot like a bee, don't they? They've got these real stripes and most um, species of hopper fly, they do what's called, they mimic bees. So they have evolved to look a lot like bees. And the reason for this is that um, it's a, a strategy to not be eaten by birds and other insects. So birds will learn that a bee can sting them and they'll learn that that red, uh, sorry, that the orange or yellow and black striped pattern means you're gonna be stung. Um, so they, they won't attack an insect that looks like that, but these hoverflies, they won't sting at all. They've just evolved to look the same way as a bee to avoid being eaten. So it's a very clever strategy. Um, so they've got one set of wings that are definitely flies. And as juveniles, they really look quite maggoty. They're just a little maggot. They've got no legs, but what they do have is this hooked mouth part. And if you see a video of one, it actually hooks right out. And it's again, very, very good at eating things like aphids. Um, and you will notice them in your garden, especially at this time of year, out in the sun, they really do hover. So they, they can stay very flat. Um, um, so next time you're out in your garden, have a look around, have a look around the flowers because they eat pollen when they're adults um, and see if you've got any in your garden. Now, does anybody know what these are? I haven't made a poll for these, but they're probably something that you've seen around your house and they often really stump people. These kind of little packets of mud that are stuck up on the ceiling. Um, most people recognize they came from a wasp, but they might not know the full story. So this is from a mud dabble wasp. And what actually happens with these wasps is they collect spiders. So the wasps will go out, they'll find a spider, they'll sting the spider while it's still alive, they'll bring it back and they'll stuff it into this little clay pot that they've stuck up on your wall. And then they lay their eggs on it. So there's a couple of spiders in each pot, they lay their eggs on there and the spiders are paralyzed and they stay alive but paralyzed within that little pot. And then as the wasp larvae grows, it feeds on these spiders. And then at this time of year, you'll start seeing them hatch out. Um, this is what the adults look like. They hatch out and you can find them flying around, buzzing around, making new nests. This is one that I found on my balcony a couple of years ago. I opened up four little nests and I found a huge variety of different spiders in there. Now, as somebody that absolutely loves spiders, this made me a little bit sad, but also absolutely fascinating that these wasps have evolved to prey on a species that's very, very hard to catch and often hard to identify as well. So keep an eye out for these as well. It's another fascinating thing you'll see in your back garden. You may, even if you're lucky, see a wasp flying around with a spider in its jaws. Now we were talking about water before, so I wanted to recognize there are some other water predators as well. Things like water beetles and water striders. Um, a lot of people don't realize, but they're predators too. So they can also be used to control mosquitoes in your gardens. Now, I will talk about spiders quickly. I do have a whole nother talk that I did for Inner West Council just on spiders. So I won't go into too much detail, but they're my favorite. So I have to talk about them a little bit. Uh, there are lots and lots of different species of spiders. So over 40,000 species, and we've got over 3,000 species in Australia. The good thing about them is they're generally generalist predators. So that means they don't focus on just eating one type of thing. They'll eat lots of different types of things. And which means they're really, really good for controlling different types of pests in your gardens. Um, especially the ones that, that build the big webs, they can think, control things like flies, moths, the ones that crawl around can eat aphids. And huntsmen, even though they have a really good, really bad reputation, people don't like having them in their, in their houses, but they are very good at eating cockroaches. So I always tell people, would you rather have a house full of cockroaches or one huntsman? That might be a difficult um, kind of question for you, but I know I'd rather have the huntsman. So we talked before a little bit about the fact that we really need to have these insects in our ecosystems, not just for the jobs that they do, but because they're really important food. So there are a lot of insectivorous birds uh, that are native to Australia, things like echidnas, and a lot of our reptiles and fish depend on these insects for their food source. But we could also in the future be relying on insects for food for us. Insects are one of the most sustainable ways of developing protein for people to eat. Um, they don't take as much water, they don't take as much space, and we can actually use them to break down waste food to produce new um, protein that we could then consume. Um, it may seem a little bit futuristic and it may seem like something that you wouldn't personally be keen on, um, but I am pretty sure that in the future we will be integrating 
the use of insects into our food systems, even if it's just for breaking down our waste, feeding to poultry and things like that, and then bringing that protein back into our systems. Very, very sustainable and something that we should definitely be paying attention to. So now we move on to the idea of how do we manage these insects in our cities? Because at the moment, I think it's a very, very difficult situation because it's not just these services that are provided. There are also disservices we have to pay attention to with particular insects in cities. There's things like um, disease vectors. So we've got mosquitoes that can carry things like malaria. Um, we have plant damage that can happen for um, urban agriculture and property damage from things like termites. But the problem is, is that people have this perception that most insects will do them harm, which is simply not true. So they have a garden like this. Personally, I'd be pretty happy with a garden like that. But they detect one or thing, two things they don't like. Maybe they don't like spiders or they don't like cockroaches. And they do this and kills off everything. Because a lot of the pesticides we use are broad spectrum pesticides. It means they're designed to kill all insects. And what happens is that the only things that actually survive and come back are these guys. And then this happens because you've taken away all their competitors and you've taken away all of their predators. Sorry, and then what can I just interrupt for a sec? It's Emma yeah. here. Um, your slides aren't moving on. Um, so just might need to just go back over those last few. Okay, where are you at the moment? Just on the spider. Oh, okay. Um, slide. It yeah. might be because the transcript is running at the same time. So it might be a bit slow. Okay, I'm not sure. I think there was another message from Kribo also. She couldn't see them. So I thought that's possibly... Still on the okay. slide page. I'd love to see the pictures of the gardens that you're showing, yeah. but I couldn't see them. Um, okay, I can see the newer pages. So maybe if I stop sharing and share again, I can try that. No, it's not letting me do that. Sorry, just let me play around with it for a second. Sure, thanks. Thanks, and it's really, really amazing what you've already um, gone through and all the beautiful pictures. And there are a couple of um, questions in the chat, but I'll let you sort that out first and then. Yeah, I think my Zoom's having trouble. Let me okay. Just... Do you want me to see if I can? Um, move it on for you well yeah maybe if you can i need to just stop sharing so i can start sharing again yeah i can't see anything now <laughs> i've been totally taken out let me just i might have to leave and come back again okay sure that's fine so if anyone has any comments or questions at the moment while Lizzie's just yeah, um, write them in the chat. Yeah, write them in the chat or if you'd like to put your camera on and and um any comments at the moment so far about the talk, happy to have a little conversation while while Lizzie is working that out. So feel free to put your hand up or just turn your camera on. Can you still see me? Yes, I can see you and I can see the spider slide. Yeah, it's completely frozen for me, so I can't see anything at all. I might just pause the recording for a sec. Yeah. These are the, it's the, um, the animals that rely on insects for their food sources. This is the food that we might be eating in the future. Um, might make you feel a bit ill to think about it, but you know, I don't actually mind the idea of chomping down on some bugs. Uh, and this is the idea that actually not all the bugs are doing us a service and we need to think about some of them that are actually disservices in our urban areas. And this is the ideal garden, right? Lots of insects, um, lots of different types of insects, but spraying them means that only the bad guys come back again. So we've got the flies and the cockroaches that will survive and they come back because we've just taken away all of the other good guys that are competing with them and then are eating them. So insect sprays can be a real problem in urban areas. And they're a real problem because a lot of people are using them. I might be speaking to the converted here, but um, Australians spend over $150 million a year on insecticides. And basically the amount that we're spraying on our houses is higher than the amount that's actually used in agriculture in some areas. So this is horrifying. And a lot of it is completely non-essential. 
So people are spraying things like moths or wasps and things that are never going to do them any harm. Um, or they're getting in pest controllers to do a broad spectrum spray of their garden twice a year, just because it's what they've always done. And it's really not necessary and it's really harming our ecosystems. <clears throat> so this is something I've been looking into for a couple of years now. And it's basically something I always like to pay um, people's attention to because it's a huge problem. But let's talk about the positive way of how we can encourage insects and especially pollinators and predators into our gardens. Native plants are always going to be a good idea. So things like wax flowers, grevilleas and eucalypts, they have these beautiful big flowers. They're gonna attract a huge array of pollinators. And when you've got pollinators there, the predators will also come. And you may not want them eating your pollinators, but it means that you're developing a more balanced ecosystem. You, the more species you have in an ecosystem, the more healthy it's going to be. But they also like non-native plants. So you may have basil or something like that in your garden and you'll notice that it's being visited by pollinators. I actually think that it doesn't have to be native plants. I think that just having vegetation of some sort in your garden is a really good start. Having as many flowers as you can there, having different densities. So you've got high treetop cover, you've got stuff down on the ground, you've got maybe some middle um, layer vegetation. This is what's gonna be creating the habitat for these insects. Um, when we think about habitat, um, this is what I mean about having things on the ground, but also having some bare space sometimes, um, having a bit of leaf litter around. I say it's good to be a messy gardener because actually we don't need these highly manicured spaces. If you let it go, if you leave a little bit of leaf litter around, this is the spaces where the insects are going to be able to thrive. I've got a picture of a bee hotel here and bee hotels are a little bit contentious because they only work for particular species and they can actually increase the amount of disease that a bee is um, exposed to. I love them as an education resource because we can get in there and we can look at the kind of bees that are coming in, but don't rely on a bee hotel to provide the ho the, all of the habitat that you'll need for bees in your gardens. And also just the, the image here of a bee drinking, they do need water. So if you can have some kind of water sources in your garden, also keeping in mind the mosquito problem of being of needing to refresh that water. And basically just not spraying, letting the good bugs come in, letting those predators come in and do the controlling of the pests for you. So I wanted to just flag here, this is right at the end of my talk. These are some photos that I've taken with my kids in my garden over the last couple of years. There is so much out there to see. And it's the thing that I love most about insects and spiders is that you are never going to run out of new things to discover. And one really nice way to keep track of this is to use the iNaturalist app. So it's basically an app that you can use and you can record all of the sightings you see of any plant or animal or fungi. I've got some really good lichen in there. Um, you upload it to the iNaturalist platform. It's there, then you've got your doc, all of your photos documented of all the biodiversity that you've discovered. And experts from around the world can actually come on <laughs> and help you identify those insects or, or whatever it is that you've put on there. Um, the the um, computer learning system within the app also gives you a really good guess of what species it might be sometimes. So you upload your picture, you say, um, what species might this be? And it'll give you a couple of options. And sometimes they're actually very, very accurate. Sometimes they're wrong, um, but it's actually an amazing way for people who don't have a good knowledge of insects to, to learn and to, to understand what species they might have in their gardens. Also, the, you uploading this information can be really, really valuable for scientists. So all of the information from my naturalist is taken up by Atlas of Living Australia. And it means that scientists like me can actually come online. We can see every record that people have um, logged in of a particular species. So this is the blue banded bee. And then we can use that information in our studies of these species to look at where they're moving, even possibly looking at how they might change over time with things like climate change. So this is my final slide, just to, to portray some of the amazing insects we have there. Really, really lovely to have you online. I'll come back to those questions now. Um, and you can find me on Twitter if you've got additional questions you wanted to ask. So I'll open up that chat now and have a look. Oh, we had an extra picture from you, uh, slide from you too, didn't we, Emma? Yeah, but um, I can help guide you with some of those questions first, actually, because sure, yeah. we've got a little bit of time. So we, maybe we can go back to your um, <coughs> slide as well. But um, yeah, there was one earlier on from Rose and she was saying um, that she did have some lacewing eggs in her backyard and um, or her 
garden, I guess. So it's really fantastic when um, you learn what they are and know how to identify um, the lacewing eggs. I remember yeah, first, everywhere. <laughs> first knowing what they were on, the, on my clothesline and it was really great to understand what they are. Hey, little man, nice to see you. Um, and so she said that they didn't hatch and she just wondered if there was anything that she could do to encourage yeah. to hatch. Are you sure they didn't hatch? Because they're, they're very, very tiny when they hatch out and it's quite hard to see if they're open or not. So um, because I've got ones in my um, balcony and things that have been there for years, so they could have possibly been one from last season and they were already open or they hatched without you noticing them. Um, they do vary a lot among the years as well and the one thing that i've noticed is that humidity and the amount of water around is one of the main drivers of that so if we have a really dry year which we did like two years ago um what was it 2019 we had that really really hot year and it was really really dry for all of autumn um, and i was actually noticed <laughs> i was noticing that um you know the bugs and the spiders were just dropping dead from the trees it was just too dry it was too hot um, and it's quite concerning because we're going to have more of those really hot, dry days in the future. Um, and it, it could be a really, really big problem for all of these important insects I've talked about today. Yeah, absolutely. It's certainly something um, to think about how we are going to continue to make sure we have enough of that habitat around our urban environment. And I think you touched on, you know, not, not just grabbing the sprays or the pesticides at every moment but there was a question from Stephen and he was just curious how you can tell people not to use the sprays because you know I think for a lot of people it is part of habit so yeah. any tips I guess maybe on that and to be honest the people that are using them out of habit are the ones that are easiest to break out of it because they don't really appreciate what they're doing um so the way that I do it is by doing this you know telling people about the amazing insects that are in their garden uh, and the ones that they might be killing. But to be honest, the best gateway insect is the bees. So if you get people to care about bees, and people do care about bees, it's really easy. You tell them, you know, you put a bee hotel in their garden, they're not gonna spray anymore because they don't wanna hurt those bees. So as much as I would love for people to be doing it for the spiders, I often use the bees as a way to get people on board and to start thinking about their insecticide use and then taking it onwards from there. But also, I mean, People need to start realizing that these insecticides are hurting their families and their pets as well. They're, they're nasty chemicals, um, and they're not they're not the stuff we want to be putting around in our homes. And that's another kind of method that I use. No, stop. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's right. So also there was another mention of just people. Uh, someone saw a Facebook post just around um, the availability of bee hotels being made, and some of them were made from treated wood that could actually kill yeah. bees. Do you know much about this at all? Yeah, well, the funny thing about bee hotels is they're not actually designed for Australian bees at all most of the time. They're kind of mass produced in China from European um, blueprints. And yet yeah, they're, they're not the right size. They're not the right depth for our native bees. So they're generally just not the right thing for us to be using for Australian bees. Um, one of the things you can do is just drill holes of different um, depths into old pieces of wood. Like that's basically, you know, that's a good way to do it. Um, rather than using something, as you said, that's got treated wood that's actually gonna kill the bees when they lay their, um, their eggs in there anyway. Yeah, great, thank you. And um, Rose had a question. She was asking um, about bee eaters. Like, how do they not get stung? <laughs> and like, you know, that's a interesting. Yeah, bee eaters, the birds. That's a good question. I don't actually know. I imagine that they, because some of them, I know that some birds are able to get the sting off. So you'd actually, you catch the bee from the back and you would wipe the sting on the branch and the sting would get caught and you would pull out and then they eat the bee. I don't know if that's what bee eaters do, but you know it it would make sense if they did it that way still so much more to learn isn't there exactly. around all of this stuff which is you know why your work is so valuable do you want me to finish talk about um the council stuff and then we go back to a few more questions or how yeah, you not. tracking lizzie yeah i'm good okay great so i just wanted to let people know i know you've um shown some great pictures of 
you know, how to identify lots of um, the insects, but also, you know, just understanding more locally in, in the West how we can um, create the, the habitat and the environment for all of these great creatures that you've talked about. So the NOS Council does have on our website some community resources. So you can see if you go to our website page, um, Nature for Backyards, you can actually click on all of these squares which step you through, you know, the types of biodiversity in the NOS and what we're aiming to do and um, to help the biodiversity in our area. Um, you know, what you can do to plan a native garden and create native garden spaces. Um, so, yeah, lots of resources on there to help you restore your backyard if you'd like to. And we also run workshops throughout the year around, you know, building ponds and water-related issues around that too. Um, but I guess, you know, as you said, it doesn't have to be just native um, plants. And there was someone that was asking probably a more food pest related question um, they're asking how how they can keep um, caterpillars or bugs off their tomatoes I think that's really content for a whole nother um, workshop really but it is about getting that balance isn't it in your garden even with vegetables yeah well so caterpillars is obviously one of the main pro um, problems that I deal with now that I work in agriculture as well because there's lots of pest moths that lay their eggs on crops and what we do is we rely often on parasitoid wasps. So these are wasps, they're not parasites, they're slightly different in that they lay their eggs within the caterpillar, the eggs grow up within the caterpillar and then hatch out killing the caterpillar. So a parasite doesn't actually kill its host, the parasitoid does. Um, and we've got hundreds and hundreds of native Australian species that do that. And it's basically a matter of putting up with a couple of caterpillars and waiting for the moths to come in so it's one of those things that if you spray you've killed off the um you've killed off the wasps you've killed off the caterpillars but then the good guys won't come back in again so if you leave it for a little while the wasp will detect that you've got the caterpillars in there they'll come in and they'll they'll do their job and they'll kill those caterpillars and then they'll go away again but in urban ecosystems i mean we've messed up these systems a lot um, if you don't live near native bushland, you might not have a population of them nearby that can come in. So that's why we really, really need to be thinking about how we build nature and build native vegetation into our urban areas as well. So we can get services like this predation and this parasitoid wasps coming into our gardens. Yeah, excellent. And um, Katie actually talks about a moth night um, a couple of weeks ago. I'm not sure if you knew about it, but it was on iNaturalist where people hung up a white sheet and they shone a bright light and then they could see the variety of moths that were yeah. attracted to it. So that sounds like an amazing Absolutely. project. I think that people don't anticipate how much stuff is out there at night as well. We often go spotlighting at night with the kids and they're what three and six and it's just amazing because you see spiders, you see insects, all sorts of stuff you wouldn't imagine. And the sheet with the light on it is I mean, for me, when I did that in my undergraduate studies at university, it blew my mind because there was so much stuff there. And just, I mean, you could literally find a new species doing that without too much trouble. That's what insects are like. And that's what really attracted me to it at the very beginning as well. Yeah, I can imagine it's so diverse and interesting. Yeah. And um, so there's a few great comments, one from Lou and Sandy, just talking about, you know, how great natural deterrents uh, as well, and natural predators, I guess. So Lou mentions that she's got water dra eastern water dragons in her mm -hmm. garden, which is amazing. I'm not sure if that's in the inner west, but fantastic if it is um, near water, maybe near the river somewhere. Um, she's saying that it's really wonderful for slugs and snails um, and she would never spray, so that's really great to hear. Um, just a couple of more questions, Lizzie, if you if you um, yeah. got the time. So... There was one from David. He would really like to know how to encourage ladybirds mm, in the yeah. garden. Yeah, so ladybirds are an interesting one in that they, again, will, will respond to the types of pests that are already there. Um, so if you've got a lot of aphids, I'm, I guarantee you, you'll go out there and you'll find some ladybugs. So it's, it's kind of a matter of wait and see. But ladybugs are also an interesting one because you can actually buy them. So there are companies that breed up ladybirds for this exact reason and, and for farmers to release them on farms. So you can, and same with parasitoid wasps, actually, you can actually buy 
um, lacewings, ladybirds and parasitoid wasps to release in your garden. It's it's not the first response that I would have because it's, it's, it's us meddling with the environment again, right? It's us changing things. I would love to be able to sit back and let it do its own thing, but we live, the reality is that we live in ecosystems that have already been damaged and your next door neighbor might use a whole lot of pesticides and there's nothing you can do about that. Um, so that is an option. And I actually love it for kids. I love schools that get in these lace wings and ladybirds because they can watch them. They can see them when they're the tiny little predators. They can watch them eating those aphids. They can release them in their garden. And I guarantee you that someone that's released ladybirds in their garden isn't going to spray pesticides afterwards. So as far as that's concerned, it's a win for me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just a really funny experience. Yeah, I did that. Um, I had mealybug in my garden yeah. and I bought some um, native ladybirds, you know, the black ones with the little yellow head. Um, and I still have them like six years later. That's awesome. Which is really, you know, they're, they're a part of your family. Yeah, exactly. I'm really protective of them. Um, so, few Can I just questions. answer a question here from oh, Sorry. Yep. There's a question about redback spiders, and I, I just wanted yes. to answer this one because it's something that I think about often as well. Obviously, because I've got young kids, yeah. and my kids love spiders, so it's a, it's a real problem for me. Redbacks are the only spiders that I kill. Um, I don't kill any others because basically anything else we come in contact with won't harm us. Um, redbacks are different because of where they're situated. So they're often kind of under ledges, they're under pot plants, and they do pose a risk to my family in particular because of the little kids, and they can pose a risk to pets as well. But the best way to kill them is to either catch them or put them in the fridge, which is what I do, or just squish them. Um, just, you know, flick them out, step on them. That's the best way to deal with them. You can spray them, but again, most of the sprays that are designed for spiders will affect all of the insects in your garden as well. Um, they don't have really specialised targeted pesticides for spiders. So avoid the spray if you can. I totally understand if you have to, though, because it gets to that point where you've got to protect your family. And sometimes that means that the, the redback spiders have got to go. But any other spider, um, funnel webs are a different matter, but their funnel webs are difficult to control anyway. Um, and you, you won't generally see them in the inner west. But um, any other, any spider that's in a web, like a big circular web, you definitely don't have to worry about that. Jumping spiders and things, definitely don't spray them because they're, de they're doing good jobs in your gardens. Yeah, for sure. So thank you for seeing that. The other that question there, the other one was um, from Josie. She was just curious about termites, if you had anything mm -hmm. specific you wanted to share. Yeah, yeah. So termites are a difficult one as well. Um, there are actually um, companies that are very, very good at dealing with termites without using chemicals, uh, without using broad spectrum chemicals. So some pest control companies, when you say you've got termites, they'll come and they'll do a big spray and that's a, a border spray, which will kill everything. But there are other techniques you can use for termites, which are basically like a, a granule like sand, which they take up kind of like ant sand. They take it up and they bring it back to the nest and it just kills the termites just in that nest. Um, because I do a lot of work with pest control. So I do, I understand the need for doing pest control, but if you want to do it, you want to make it as targeted as, as possible. So you want it to only kill the pests that are actually doing the damage. And for termites, that's the way to do it. You have these, these baits that the, that the termites will take back to their nest. Um, but do look out for a company that says that they'll use low chemical options rather than the ones that will just spray everything. Yeah. Wonderful. And just our very last question that's come up. So we'll leave this as the last question. So um, Rose is saying that she's got a healthy bird wing butterfly vine, um, but she's no butterflies um, this season as yet. Um, anything she could do to encourage them? Yeah, well, there's actually, there was another um, question that came through to me privately on the chat was, where is the golden orb weaver spiders gone? Because there used to be lots and then there's none. And this happens with insects all the time and spiders. They're very, very um, variable in their, um, in their seasons. So when I was doing my PhD, I, the first year of my PhD, I went there to study golden orb weaving spiders. I collected a whole lot of them. I had a great year, I had so many to work with. And the next year I came back and there were none at all. And I thought, oh, what have I done? I've killed them all because I collected some. Um, but it just turns out that they're just really variable. So I spent four years studying this one species. I studied everything about it. I looked at its biology. I looked at where it was living. I looked at its environment and what it was eating. And I could not work out what it was that was causing it to change on different years. 
Yeah, that's really interesting um, that, you know, we can't expect from season to season to be seeing the same um, thing. So, yeah, that's really, really interesting. And so, all right, well, AJ said that, um, so she said it's very nice, Lizzie. She said thank you so much for making time on your Saturday afternoon. Sorry about uh, the interruptions. It's kind of a constant in my house. <laughs> that's just, you know, that's what's like having young children. It's perfectly fine. So we really do appreciate you being with us to share all your knowledge today. And I'm sure we've all learned um, something. And, you know, just seeing those beautiful pictures just makes anyone the afternoon better, I, I think.